Welcome to the Grow My Salon Business podcast, where we focus on the business side of hairdressing. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and I'll be talking to thought leaders in the hairdressing industry, discussing insightful, provocative, and inspiring ideas that matter. So get ready to learn, get ready to be challenged, get ready to be inspired, and most importantly, get ready to grow your salon business. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Grow My Salon Business Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and it's great to have you join us here today. My guest on today's episode is Tom White from the Melbourne Salon by the name of Same Same But Different. Now, these days, we talk a lot about the changing culture in salons and the changing needs and expectations of today's workforce. And Tom is a salon owner who has an interesting take on what creating a modern salon culture is all about. So in today's podcast, we talk about brand pillars, we talk about flexible working hours, motivation, profit margin, salon retail, and lots more. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you very much for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. Now, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Tom. I think you, uh, you you bring an interesting sort of energy to salon ownership. I know before we were, before I pushed the record button, you know, we were having this conversation about the new generation of salon owners. And it's an interesting time because, you know, I think Gen Z, you know, younger hairdressers now, are uh, demanding a different way of thinking, a different way of working. And and that's great. I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that a lot of salon owners are from a different, I, I'm not going to say work ethic, they're from a different way of doing things. Yeah. And so you have this sort of uh, battle between the two of, of uh, listen, I've still got to try and run a profitable, viable <laughs> business here. Yeah. And staff members saying, but I don't want to work Saturdays. I only want to work three days a week, you know, yada, yeah. yada, yada. So the, the sort of general theme of how we're going to talk or, or the way I want to take this interview is talking about you because you're very much a new generation of salon owners. So you're not having to be convinced to do things differently. You think differently anyway, uh, which is great. But listen, I've already, you know, gone ahead of myself. Uh, let's let's just go back a little bit. I want you to do what I, what I ask everyone to do, uh, pretty much everyone, and that is to introduce himself. So uh, who is Tom White? So give us your two minute backstory and then we can get into things. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, yeah, so it's nice that I'm still classed as that new age generation because I'm 35 and some people think it's a bit over the hill sometimes. So I'm really glad that I'm still part of that new generation. Um, so just. I said, to yeah, just right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it though. I will take it. A age, um, is, age is a mindset and you have oh. the mindset of the younger generation. So that's nice way of saying immature. Yeah. Love it. Um, right. So I'm from England originally. Uh, I grew up in Wolverhampton or just outside Wolverhampton, which is in the Midlands. I moved over to Australia in uh, 2010, so I've been here 13 years in March. I lived in Sydney for a year, wasn't really my jam, moved to Melbourne where I, f I kind of found my calling, I suppose. Um, I didn't start hairdressing until I was 20 years old. I'd kind of bounced around a little bit. I suppose the same as any English young man, I wanted to be a footballer. Didn't work out like most of us. Chose hairdressing and really found a love, not necessarily for the art side of things, but for the technical side of things, I, I'm not an arty guy. I never have been. I can't draw. I can't paint. But I like building things. I like building structures. So I kind of found my love for hairdressing there, especially in haircutting. Um, moved to Australia. Uh, I worked for a couple of different companies. No one big, really. I've never worked for anyone like like a Trevor Sorbet in England. or like, I've never done anything like that. I've always worked for local independents and just worked my ass off to try and be as good as I possibly can. So one thing I've always had is a really good work ethic. Never been the most talented, just been had a really good work ethic, so I'll outwork people. Um, and it's all kind of eventually come to this point where I own a salon, uh, I travel internationally educating, I've won a few awards, I've meant to head rest of the year, I've won a few business awards, finals from business awards. Um, but I, I'd very much say I'm very much at the very, very beginning of what I plan to do in terms of, and I, I'm not afraid to say, I want to build an empire. I want to change some things. I want to make sure my way isn't necessarily the accepted way, but it's a way that people can look to them and go, oh, I can pull a few points out of that and use it for this. So this is why I was so keen to come on here, if I'm honest. Okay, good. All right, fantastic. Do you have any Italian blood in you? 
No, I don't, but my wife is Italian background, so well, I reckon the, the, 10 years the reason I, <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, there's a bit of interference coming because you're, you're, you're waving oh, your arms around, you're banging yeah. the, the microphone. Yeah. So uh, that, I, was, I was being uh, a bit yeah. of a smart aleck after <laughs> that. Um, okay, so let, let me just start with the fact that you now have your own uh, salon. Yeah. Uh, it has an interesting name, and the name itself is, I think, sums up an awful lot about you and your whole philosophy. Yeah. So the name of the salon is called Same, Same, But Different, which is an unusual name for a salon. But t tell us your, your thinking behind that, because it's more than just a name. Yeah, it is more than just a name. So when, so what I wanted to do was create a place and a working environment that I always wanted to be part of as an employee. Now, I know this sounds quite cliche, and that's really technically what you're supposed to be doing when you're building a business, but it's a lot harder and a lot harder to actually put in place um, than what it turns out to be, right? So when I was building it and when I was working, because I built the framework of the company first and built the structure of the company first. And as I was doing it and talking about it, and I was speaking to two mates who are also hairdressers, and we were at... Um, our version of like Salon International in in uh, Australia. It was called Hair Expo at the time. And we were sat around we having some food and we were talking about these ideas. And my mate turned around and said, you know, it's like the same thing, but different, isn't it? And I was like, that's actually <laughs> exactly what it is. It, essentially, we are a salon. You can't, you can't look past that. We're a salon. We do hair. But the framework, the way we're doing it and what we're trying to achieve is different. I grew up in a time... And I think it was the very back end where salons were the cornerstone of the community. Everything that good that happened in that town ran through the salon where I did my apprenticeship. And I loved mm. it because it was just, even though you weren't involved in a particular aspect of the town or the community, you still felt involved because it was running through the salon one way or another. And I wanted that back. I want that feeling back where people come to the salon, not just have their hair done, but for a bigger um I suppose, a bigger area of their life where they can connect with other business owners that come into that salon. So you create a proper community within that salon, not just from hairdresser to client or guest, but from guest to guest to guest to guest to guest and build a proper community. So mm. that was kind of the cornerstone of what I was trying to do. But then on the, the I suppose, the working aspect of it um, for the employees, I, I, I admire Scandinavia for what they've done over the last 12, 15 years. Now, if anyone hasn't studied the model of what some Scandinavian countries do, their approach to work-life balance is like no other in the world. It is beautiful, productive, profitable, and I believe the way it should be done. So what they've done mm -hmm. is they've, they've thrown away the 38-hour working week. They've converted to 31. And now they're doing 31 hours over four days which is also on a 38 hour a week salary. So they haven't dropped wages. What they've noticed is that productivity has gone from around about 67% in most full-time workers to beyond 80%. And that's in offices. That's, I don't know if it was much in hairdressing. It wasn't really part of the data that was accrued, but in offices, in engineering, in architecture, all these kind of jobs that didn't just speak to the left-hand side of the brain or the right-hand side of the brain, there was mixes. It worked across the board. So I was like, well, okay. why can't we do that? Like, what's so hard about that? So I put it forward and said, this is what I want to do. I want to open four days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. No weekends, I believe. Listen, it will change eventually, but right now in Melbourne where I am, because of what happened with COVID, and it did play a key factor with us being locked down for so long, and a lot of people working from home, it was the perfect opportunity to open four days and work Tuesday to Friday as a test, as a pilot. And it just worked really, really well. The staff are very productive. We're, instead of staff members having like 15 minute gaps here, an hour gap here, 45 minutes here, they're pretty much back to back all the time. Because even though they've got the same amount of 38 hours to work in, Clients think that we're not open as much, so they're more on top of rebooking for the year, making sure they're recommending friends so they can get their bonuses and stuff like that. Um, so I really wanted to build something that was for not just the guest, but also for the hairdresser, where we're available for you whenever you want. That's how you make money. You have to appease the masses in a way. But you also have to make sure that your staff, and number one really, it's really is number one, your staff have to be really happy. They're happy, they're productive, they're productive, they make money, they make money, you're happy. 
So that's kind okay, of what builds it around. All right, that, that's that's fascinating. Lots to dig in there. Uh, first thing I want to, to just clarify. So you've said in Scandinavia, that's what's happening. So where, where are we talking? Finland, Norway, Sweden? Norway it, and Sweden it... are the two main ones. Right. Norway and Sweden. Okay. I'm pretty sure Denmark and Finland have variations of it, but the main case studies I saw were coming out of Oslo. They were the main okay. case studies. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And yeah. and it's not any specific industry. You're, no. you're saying that this is a fairly accepted way of now working in uh, yeah. those countries. And it, okay, it has been for like, it has been for, I reckon it's got to be close to a decade now where yeah. it's been a regular part of working culture. Right, okay. All right. Um, so me with my salon owner hat on, mm -hmm. I'm going, okay, so... Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're open, you're busy, you know, you're fully booked, you're making money. And as a salon owner, I'm then thinking to myself, well, why shouldn't we also then, I'm not saying that people should necessarily work more than four days a week, but I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, I'm still paying rent mm -hmm. on Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Maybe there's an opportunity here to have a different shift with different people you know, different team, literally, that works Saturday, mm. Sunday, Monday, uh, to create that option for people. Because I know people that, um, I, I know someone who has gone back into the industry specifically because she can only work Saturday and Sunday because that's the day her husband's home to look after the kids. So mm. husband works in his <laughs> job Monday to Friday uh, to put a bit of extra money in the, you know, in the family, you know, budget. She loves working all day Saturday, all day Sunday uh, yeah. in the salon without it impacting on their family life because husband's yeah. home looking after the kids. So from <laughs> from so there is definitely a market for people that is not a one off situation who want to work Saturdays and Sundays. And from a salon owner's point of view, you're definitely still paying your landlord rent, even though your salon is closed on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So yeah. talk to me about the Tom White opinion on what I've just said as to why you wouldn't do that or shouldn't do that. No, I, I actually fully agree with you. I do. I think that the problem that I have at the minute is we've been open for nearly two years. <clears throat> Putting this new theory, it's not really a new theory. There's other people that do what I'm doing. Maybe not mm. all of it put together, but there's people that open four days a week and choose out of Friday, but it's still a very new concept. It still takes people a lot of time to get used to. And I really want to drive home the fact that it works. You can open four days a week and make more money than if you're open for six. Right. And the reason why I say it is because I've proven that it can be done. And so we turn over more, the profit's higher, uh, everyone gets paid more. It, it's more all across the board. But what you're saying is completely right. And that is where I'd like to take my business next is have okay. a Saturday, Sunday, Monday team which want to work Saturday, Sunday, Monday. See, I've got a crew yeah. that don't want to work Saturday, Sunday, Monday. They don't. Mm. They want to go out mm. gigs on Friday night with their mates. And they want to have a few drinks and not worry about coming to the salon at nine o'clock to do Mrs. Smith's colour. <laughs> they don't want to worry about it. So yeah. at the time, it suited me, the crew, the direction that I wanted to put the salon. It worked. It just married well together. But I'm totally with you. If I could get a team that wants to work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I could get five or six of them, Mate, the salon will be open tomorrow on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, because I'm not going to turn down extra cash. Because you're right, sure. I'm still paying rent for the seven days, what I might happen before. Mm. But right now, until I systemize the salon where I can scale it at a proper level, because that's what the mm. idea is to open two, three, four, maybe even five. Depends how dumb I get. <laughs> depends how much I like torture. Well, depend on how many I open. Um, until I get to that point where I feel that the systems are so well in place, they're so embedded into people's minds that I technically don't have to be there at all. That's where I want to get it to, even though I will be there. I want to get to a point where I don't have to be there at all. <clears throat> then I think then Saturday, Sunday, Mondays, I can start looking at that and playing around a bit more with it, even get independent contractors in for Saturday, Sunday, Monday, where they can rent a chair. There's loads of different things I'm playing around with at the minute, but they are, they're definitely a year or two off. Okay. All right. Uh, so how many, how many chairs have you got in the salon? Uh, I've got 50, uh, hold on. Uh, 15 chairs, yeah. Right. How many staff have you got there? Uh, there were 10 now. Right. Okay. Yeah. But that's right. a mix of support um, staff as well. Yeah. So what, what was the point where you were working for someone else and you thought, 
it's time to go out there and do this on my own. What what was that? that what was the catalyst for that? What, you know, what what was the, the point in your life where you woke up and thought, "I've got to do this by myself"? Now? <laughs> do you know what? Seriously, the very first day I started my apprenticeship, <laughs> I was just like, so "Sod it's this!" It's always been your thing. Always, right, okay. always. Yeah, and it never was supposed to be. It was never. Like I listen, I love your podcast, so I listen to it all the time, and I listen to idols of mine that you have on your podcast. And it, it was, there was a certain point in time where someone went, right, this is where I need to do it, and this is what I want to do. I didn't have that. Mine was just, as soon as I started in the industry, I was like, I, whether it was an inflated ego, possibly. I mean, I was 20 years old, English, bit of a geezer. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I had a big ego for a long time. So um, I reckon it was inflated ego. And I was just like, I know I can do this different or better. I know mm -hmm. I can. Whenever I can do it now, whether it's 10 years down the track, I don't know. Um, see, it was always from the very beginning. I suppose when it really hit home, it was time. When I was over here and my permanent residency came through so I could actually stay here for good, um, I'd settled down a little bit. I was probably 27 when I was like, all right, I need to give this a bloody red hot go. I'd been educating for companies for a while, not much, but doing a bit. And I was like, I like the education, I really do. But I always saw myself trying to put a, an imprint on the industry one way or another. Mm. What, what, what do you wish you'd known before you opened up? Do you know what? Genuinely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because okay. I, I found, I suppose, I used to be part of a, a group where there used to be three salon owners, three salons. Um, it was structured a little bit differently where one person owned a little bit more than the other two of us. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of had a, a bit of a an apprenticeship in there. So I used to work for that salon and then I bought into it. Okay, um, got it. Mm. And that, that kind of gave me a, an insight into what being mm. a business owner was, but it never taught me anything because I stayed away from the numbers. It wasn't really something that I... I found myself drawn to, I was still very much technical hairdresser. I wanted to win awards. I wanted to be on stage. I want my name in lights. That's what I wanted at that particular time. Um, and it, that was just purely to satisfy my ego. I knew it at the time then I know it at the time now it was more to give myself a pat on the back and go, yes, you made the right decision because mm. even though I don't care what people think I don't. And I mean that in the most respectful and loving way in terms of, I hold my opinion of myself always higher than anybody else's. If I can look myself back in the mirror and go, you're doing a good job, your morals are good, you're pushing the right buttons, then I don't really care what anyone has to say. But I, I knew, I've always known that I've had an ego that I've had to satisfy. And I always thought that would be through awards and name up in lights and doing shows and all this. And it, it never satisfied me enough. Um, so when I, when I left the group I was with and started the new salon, I actually found that that drive and hunger for my name up in lights actually wasn't about my name up in lights. It was more actually changing things, believing what I intrinsically believe to be the best way to work and the best way to treat people and the best way to build people up, the best way to teach people. That's what I want to push out. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so th that's, that's an interesting business model in itself that you just touched on where there was a group, yeah. Because there's a lot of power in a group as well. There's that, that yeah, power of group power. think and yeah. different people have different levels of knowledge that they can share with each other. And and yeah. it is quite like you used it as an example of it was quite a nurturing environment yeah, for you to yeah. sort of learn the ropes without all the risk. Is that model something that you would ever consider as a way to grow a business? Oh, absolutely. So I believe, and I think you've touched on this with someone, it might even be uh, Gordon in a previous podcast uh, that I listened to, and I could totally agree with it. Why we don't, as an industry, have a setup like accountants and lawyers, where we have partners and grow the business that way, is beyond me. I don't know whether, it, once again, it's ego that stops people from doing it, or whether they genuinely believe they can do every job all the time on their own. But it Anything like that, you're going to get to a point and you're going to stop. You can't grow past a certain point because you can't do it all on your own. So, yeah, the plan is to bring – I've got three or four at the minute where they're all kind of keen. Um, it's more that we both parties aren't quite ready yet. I'm looking at salon number two this year. I think this year might be the time where I pull the pin and actually go for it. 
Um, I would love to bring some of the staff that I've had for who have been with me for five years. I'd love to bring some of them into the business, open new salons and build this from the inside out. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I would love to be able to do partners and stuff for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, when we started off talking about this being a sort of a, a, a new way of working, a new way of looking at the industry, mm. I think that, that that is an area where there's potentially a lot of growth. Um, mm. I did a podcast, uh, it was with a gentleman by the name of Blake Evans, it was episode 156, and he has that very model where there are partners in the business. So if you haven't listened to that or if the people that are watching or listen to this one now, if you want to check that out and find out more about it, I highly recommend it because uh, he's a very open book on it and really shares how to make that work. And uh, mm. and he definitely does make it work or they definitely do make it work, yeah. um, which which I think is a great way to grow. It's a great way to expand. Um, I know that when you opened your business, you had a business partner. Um, talk to us about that. Yeah, so that that was that was in the that was in the old group. <clears throat> I had one direct business partner, even though there was three of us. Mm. Um, the way we'd structured it over here in Australia, once you I don't know if it's the same anywhere else, but once you go over a certain amount of salary spend per mm. year, you pay an mm. additional tax on top of that salary. Yeah. Right? That's a that's a uniquely Australian thing, as far as I'm yeah, aware. There's a lot of uniquely yeah. Australian things that I found difficult to get yeah. to grips with when I first moved to the UK. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like there's yeah. some stuff that I was just like, this is insane. Um, mm. Yeah. So what we did is we structured the company. So even though we ran under an umbrella company, all three businesses were separate, so they never got grouped for payroll mm. tax, is what we call it. Yeah. Um, so I had one direct business partner. That direct business partner was an, a, a trained accountant, um, also a qualified hairdresser, but did accountancy first. Uh, and it, it, wor it worked well. It worked well. Um, kind of, she stayed in her lane. I stayed in my lane. I looked after the salon and the correct direction of the salon and what we wanted to do. She stayed in her lane, looked after the accounts and the money and paid the wages, all the stuff that I thought was absolute crap. I didn't want anything to do with because I thought it was just, time that taken up that I could be designing a new haircut. <laughs> mm. How little did I know that this would be my absolute passion would be the numbers <laughs> behind the company mm. and what I would learn from the numbers actually dictates the creative direction in which I'm taking the salon now, which I find very ironic considering I hated it. Um, partnership worked well. It just got to a point where I wanted to do things very differently. And there was one or two thoughts in my head. One, if it didn't go wrong, if it didn't go right, sorry, which I'll be honest, I had no doubt it would go right. Right, That's just my self-confidence. Um, but if it did go wrong, I didn't want to drag anyone else down in it. I thought that was unfair. Um, secondly, I actually don't think she wanted any part of it anyway. <laughs> I thought she thought I was fucking batshit crazy. <laughs> sorry for the language, but I thought she was, she, I think she thought I was nuts. So I think she was all right just to get out. So I bought her out and then um, started again. But it did mean I had to learn all the business side of things very, very quickly, which I've enjoyed massively. And it was all during uh, COVID. So the company opened in uh, April 2021. And mm -hmm. in Melbourne, <clears throat> we shut down for four months in June 2021. So I just spent about $200,000. And then we went to earning $0 for four months. So it was tight, very tight. But best thing I ever did. Okay. So did you start off right from the get go, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, the open days, and that was it? Or have you have you consolidated it back to that? No, we opened from the get go. Um, right. we, we did when we reopened after we came out of lockdown, because mm. it, we were only allowed five guests at any one time in the salon, we did open Saturdays for the first three weeks until that rule dropped. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, but that was the only reason why it was just to make sure that we could get everyone done before Christmas because we were the the most famous and loved people in Australia at that point hairdressers when we reopened. Mm, yeah. yeah. So w what else have you, I mean, that in itself is, you know, really interesting, the four day week and it being only Tuesday to Friday. What else have you bought into the business, which you would say is a new way of doing things? What are some of the other things you put in there? It's more systems that I've put in, which might slightly differ to um, every other salon. I mean, like I said, there is people that do this, but it's more, I'll put it all together. So we don't have 
it's starting from the very base of it, right? We don't have a mission statement. We have brand pillars. Now, the reason why we have brand pillars and not a mission statement is I want everyone to look at our brand pillars and put their own spin on it. I want them to connect with the brand pillars on their own personal level, not me ramming down someone's throat what I want them to think. So our four brand pillars are community, creativity, diversity, and honesty. And these four things mean something different to every single one of the members of staff. Now, the reason why I found this was so important was because as an employee, I found that when I got told we are a family of hairdressers and do this all and we're creative and all this, I was like, I looked at it and went, it's crap. We're not though. Like, I'm not. I'm not a creative person. So I don't want to be classed as a creative person. Like I'm technical, I'm analytical. I reverse engineer pretty much everything in my life. I do to-do lists. I wake up, I write a to-do list. I write a to-do list before I go to bed. I'm very analytical. So I wanted someone to feel connected to the company intrinsically through their own feelings. So I thought brand pillars were always better. And then on the flip side of it, I also wanted guests to be able to relate to brand pillars and put their own spin on it. We can tell them what it, believe, what it means to us but they can also relate to it and say what it means to them. And I found that has been a beautiful way of bringing clients, not just into the salon, but loving what we're doing and being part of the diversity, the gender neutral pricing, all this stuff that we've done, people are connected to it because they can relate it back to their own life one way or another, whether it's a feeling, a story, a family member, something like that. People are connected to it rather than just loving what we do with their hair. The gender neutral pricing, for one, I can't believe, and I'm going to be real blunt with this, I can't believe anyone still charges men's prices and women's prices. I really can't believe it for a multitude of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one, they take the same amount of bloody time. Like, they take the same amount of time. You try and tell me a fade in half an hour and be perfect. Unless you're a barber, you can't do it. Guaranteed. It's the same as, like, if you do a teardrop bob, right? It's going to take 45 minutes to an hour. A solid fade and a haircut, men's long haircuts, right? They take an hour. It's the same amount of time or it takes 45 minutes. So we charge for time. So the gender neutral pricing, get her in pink tax and all that was very, very well received amongst our community. We also have a very big um, non-binary and trans, uh, transgender community where I am on Chapel Street in Melbourne. Um, we're surrounded by uh, gay bars and it, the nightlife's epic. There's drag shows all the time. It's awesome, awesome. And we want to deliver a, a, a safe space for people to come in. And I know that sounds like, oh, everyone's doing safe spaces, but genuinely you can come in and be whoever the hell you want to be. I, we don't care what you identify as, what you want done. We just want to make sure you feel good, look good and come back because you're connected to us. That's all we want. Um, so I think, we, I think we've simplified the salon experience or everyone's trying to ramp it up and deliver more of this and more of that and more touch and more feel. We've simplified it and gone, like our menu is simplified. It's not like we haven't got 17 different ways to do balayage. We haven't got 15 root stretches. We haven't got anything like that. We're pushing it more to just charging for time. So we hopefully within six months, I've already started. Everyone will just have an hourly rate. You'll just charge an hourly rate plus product on top. So this opened for me bringing salon scale in, which I think it's just, it's been so good numbers wise to understand what you actually spend on color per head. I kind of knew, but you don't until you have something like this. And it is mm. revolutionized how I do my orders. My my budgets are tighter than ever. But like when I say tighter, as in I know exactly what's going to be spent and I know exactly that's going to work. Well, before, even though my numbers were good, it still ebb and flow here and there. My numbers are always good now. Um, it's even the way we... Go on. I, I just want to go back. I only managed to write one of them down. I was too busy listening to you. Yeah. Uh, the four, the four brand pillars. One yeah. of them was diversity. What were the other three? Uh, community, creativity, yeah. and honesty. Okay. Okay. And um, the the charging for time thing. Let's dig into that a little bit. So uh, at the moment, you're sort of a bit. One foot in, one foot out. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Are, I mean, I, I agree with yeah. you about it, it's it's 2023. I mean, you can't, <laughs> you 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 have to be, you can't charge women and men a different price for exactly the same service. No, and you get all these people that rattle on about, oh, but my education as a lady stylist is that the other. It's got nothing to do with it. It's nothing it, to do with it. It, it's it's, just it really yeah. comes down to when when you strip our business down to its most essential element, 
Mm. What we're really doing is buying and selling time. That's it. Like I'm buying my employees' time and I'm repackaging it and selling it to a potential client. And that's, in the middle I've ever heard it put. is is the, what I need to operate the business on and make a profit. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Um, and that is the reality of it. And to to be charging uh, more for a man's haircut than a uh, sorry, be charging more for a woman's haircut than a man's haircut with the same appointment time mm. is wrong. The only validation you can have for doing it is when you say a man's haircuts are 30 minutes, if that's what you chose to do. I'm just using this yep. as an example. Yeah. A woman's haircuts are 45 minutes. Therefore, yep. there is a different price yep. point to them yep. both. You know? Yeah, um, exactly right. Uh, but but even then, you could you could dig into into, oh, into women that have fades, more. women have long hair. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's yeah. literally it's cross like that concept for men's and women's haircuts came from the 1950s and 60s, where mm. women were taking an hour and a half inside salons to have beehives to be under the hood dryer, and men were literally just having the side shaved and it slicked back. That's where mm. that came from, and it was all based around charging for time, and then somehow. Through the 70s and 80s and 90s, it's been misconstrued and we've just kept the same thing, even though both styles have merged together, we've kind of mm. kept the same thing. I do honestly believe that our industry is so stuck in its way sometimes and it, it falls behind so many industries in progression, but then all we do is shout about progression. I find it so ironic because yeah, I think yeah, we're I actually one of the least yeah. progressive yes, industries in the entire world. Yeah. But well, we yeah, think we're really progressive, but we ain't. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. We we are in the change business. We change people's yeah. appearance. But we won't change ourselves and the business exactly. we run. It's not yeah, exactly. I I, I talk to salon owners about you know have you got online booking and they go oh no I haven't got that. I don't <laughs> yeah, that. I don't. And, and yeah, it's like you know do, do you book your holidays online? Oh yeah. Do you book a pizza online on a Friday night? Oh definitely. What about Very Uber? Well. Oh yeah, I've got, I've yeah. got to have my Uber. But yeah. it, it's like yeah, our uptake. As an industry, as a generalization, our uptake on technology is, you know, slow. In fact, mm. I don't know if you've listened to them. I've, uh, I think the second one actually just comes out today on the day of recording this. Uh, I'm doing a series of interviews with um, the trade media. I did the first one with Stacey Sobel from uh, Salon Today in the United States. The second one is with Linda Woodhead from uh, oh, Australia. I love and Linda. One of my favorite people. The third one. The third one I've done is with Hairdressers Journal in the UK. Yeah. And it's interesting because I wanted to get a very global perspective from their point of view on the industry because they have quite a unique perspective on the industry because they deal with salons, they deal with, um, you know, manufacturers, etc. cetera. Yeah. And so they have an insight that is that is different. And so it's been intriguing for me as I've, I've interviewed them, because what is really apparent is that when I started hairdressing, the trade media was a magazine. Yeah, that was it. They did a magazine. And we think that our industry as hairdressers behind the chair has changed dramatically. <laughs> it's hardly changed at all. Changed. When you look at the media, how their industry has changed dramatically, like the awards, the trade shows they do, the digital media they have, um, you know, the, the publishing of a magazine is now a very small part of what they do. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. We, we go on about how we're all about change. But when you look at how uh, other industries have had to change. It's uh, it's a, an awful lot more than what we've had to do. But anyway, I've, I've uh, interrupted your flow of things. I, I want to ask you about the culture in your business, like yeah. how you, uh, A, I'm intrigued what the culture is like, but, but B, I also want you to talk to how do you create a culture? I mean, your four brand pillars are sort of the fundamentals, the pillars of your culture. Yeah. But, yeah. but talk to us about that. That's a great question. Um, I tell you, I could literally do four hours on culture. It, it's possibly my most favorite thing to talk about and also to implement as well. So the culture, I think, gets gets chucked around a lot um, without anyone actually fully understanding. And it means different things to different people. But to me, culture is a lifestyle, right? It's a, it's a lifestyle. If you want to build a culture within a business of any sort, you have to have the foundations. That's where the brand pillars came in. So 
we've built the majority of our culture is built around the four brand pillars. The main one being honesty. I believe there is zero bitching in my salon and I can hold my hands up and say, I can guarantee there is zero bitching in my salon. And the reason why is because there is, if there is, there's more than likely that person's going to leave <laughs> quite quickly because it's something I won't put up with. We don't tolerate any form of bullying. There's always an open, uh, I don't want to say open door because that's what shit managers say. <laughs> my door's always open. It's not really. Um, but the culture is built around honesty and not just being honest with other people. More importantly, being honest with yourself, understanding your strengths and weaknesses and being open to being critiqued in a positive way so you can get better and achieve the goals that you want to achieve. That is the cornerstone of everything we've done. It's education. So our entire culture is built around honesty, which is then flowed into education, which is then coming to self-worth. And now when self-worth, what that has opened up to is people being so open with each other that the culture is all about love now. People want to nurture and protect each other. The, the level of teamwork in my salon, it, and I can't take credit for this. All I did was open the door. It's the crew that I've got have built this culture to something that I honestly didn't think I could ever have in a salon, me personally. Um, no one is ever left behind. No one leaves. If someone's running late, you'll see three people jump on a blow dry if the client's okay with it, right, to make sure that everyone finishes at the same time. There's not one person that hoovers. There's not one person. Sorry, hoover. I mean vacuum. <laughs> Hoover's a very English thing. I had to remember that. I mean vacuum. So there's not one person that vacuums. There's not one person that puts all the hot towels on with the lavender. There's not one person that cleans the basins. There's not. Everyone does everything all the time. We have morning huddles where everyone builds each other up and they look at each other's columns, not just their own, but each other's to see. I could probably help you out here if you're struggling. You probably won't, but just in case, just give me a heads up. You don't have people hiding in the back room. They're out on the floor. Do you want more foil? Do you need more color mixed in between clients? Like the culture that we have is awesome. I bloody love it. I'm so proud of it. But the one thing that it's done is it's driven way more guests into the salon because you can see my staff are genuinely happy at work, like genuinely happy. They want to be there. They enjoy it. We have a massive laugh on the floor. Like it, people come in and think it's like a club. We don't play club music. We usually play eighties because we're all a little bit older. <laughs> there's, I've got a lot of 19, 20 and 21 year olds, but there's a few of us that are in our thirties and forties and eighties just seems to get the whole salon up and about. So we play eighties music really loud. We're talking about stories. We're open about our personal lives and that's not through force. That's just people feel that comfortable to tell each other about things that their partners had done or whether they went out and had maybe one too many, a client will tell us and they fell over and that's why their hair's singed because they fell on a bonfire. That's a true story as well, by the way. <laughs> so there's a lot of, th our culture is ba built around honesty, mm -hmm. education and self-worth. Um, I believe those three things are the cornerstone of any culture you need to build. If you've got honesty, self-worth and education, I can't see what else you'd need to have a happy, honest, integral workplace. And isn't that really okay. what we're all after? Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes new salon owners, young salon owners, um, and you're not that young, but like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. But, 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 but sometimes new salon owners, they decide to open a salon because they don't like where they're working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I'll take it one step further. They don't like the way the salon is being managed. Yeah. Okay, so they decide to themselves, I could do this better. I'm going to go and open up my own business. So that off yeah. they go, they open up their own salon. And they open it with the premise of, I can do this better. I'm not going to manage people. I'm just going to employ nice people that all get on and we all share the same values. And we all, you know, going to stand yeah. around in the morning and sing Kumbaya and live happy ever <laughs> after. Yeah. But then, and, and that's the their ethos with which they go into opening their business. Yeah. But then often they get a rude awakening oh, because yeah. six months in, 12 months in or whatever, they realize that actually to varying degrees, people do need managing if they are to become the best version of themselves possible oh, for, and for the yes. business to, yeah. to deliver some, you know, consistency and some standards, mm -hmm. etc. So I'm wondering where you fit in relation to that. And the, the ultimate question I really want to ask you about is 
So based on what I've just said, how hands on are you as a manager in oh, terms very. of directing the orchestra, so to speak? Very, very. And I think to begin with, it was very obvious my hands were on everything. Um, mm -hmm. So the one-on-ones we do, they're very consistent. We have organized one-on-ones like most salons do every month, but really I pretty much have one or two every single week. Um, and this is more just to check on how they're feeling, like what's going on in their lives, that kind of stuff. But what, what I've done, I'm obsessed with neuroscience and I have been for a good decade, but it's only recently where I've really started looking into it and seeing, I want to understand how people think. So I believe as hairdressers, we are just glorified salespeople. We still do sales. We're not selling a physical thing, but we're selling feelings. We're selling haircuts. We're selling people, right? We still sell things. To sell things properly, you need to understand the market that you're selling to. Now, whether you niche yourself, which I think a lot of people like doing, I personally don't like it. And I'm yet, I might be proven wrong with this as time goes on. But I, I think you can build a salon that's for everyone and not niche it, providing you build the team properly. But I'm, I, I might completely cock that up. And in two years' time, I'm always saying, sorry, Anthony, I was wrong. But I believe that when you're trying to do something like, like this, and you're trying to work out sales, you need to build the neuroscience behind the sales. So you need to have people that confident, not just in what they're selling, but them at the, themselves and understanding how they intrinsically build goals that mirror in with the goals of the salon. So it's connected. So when they win, I win, not just me winning and they get a promotion or a pay rise actually setting quantifiable goals in their one-on-ones, teaching them how to build goals and motivational stacks and discipline. So what I mean by motivational stacks is um, to build an intrinsic motivator. And so, uh, you know what, do you want me to go over intrinsic and extrinsic motivators very quickly, just so everyone understands what I'm coming from here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be very quick. So intrinsic motivator is something that you internally believe that is going to drive you forward. Right. So for me, my main intrinsic motivator is my wife. I love her with all my heart. She's the reason why I get out of bed in the morning, the reason why I work so bloody hard, the reason why I want to conquer as much as I conquer. So nothing to do with me anymore. It's I want to be able to deliver the, the life I promised my wife and I want to be able to show her the bloody world. And to do that, I need to work hard. Right. So that's my intrinsic motivator. One of about 25. Right. An extrinsic motivator to begin with is money. Right. If I was just solely motivated by money, that's only going to take me so far because my heart can never be in money. You might want money. Absolutely. Jesus. I don't know who doesn't. Money buys freedom. Freedom buys happiness, in my opinion. But intrinsically, that is not going to push you far. Having something that your heart is on the line for, that is going to you're never going to stop. You're never going to stop. I know mine. And I wanted that feeling for everybody that works for us. I wanted everyone to feel what I feel because it is, it, it's beautiful. Like I wake up every day and not one, I mean, don't be wrong. Some days I wake up and go, geez, I could do an extra couple of hours in bed. Don't be wrong. I'm not perfect. But most days when I'm out of bed, I'm like, right, let's go and make this 1% better than yesterday. Let's go and do it. Like I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I can do it. I know I can build this empire that I told myself I can build. I don't care who says I can't, I'm going to do it. So I wanted to give people that feeling. So there's a science behind it on how to build motivational stacks. You use curiosities to feed into certain things that you're curious about, and then you can link that to your job. Once you link that to your job, most people find in hairdressing, they are more passionate about the people they serve, not themselves. The best hairdressers always care about the people over themselves, always, right? You don't have to be the best technical hair cutter or the best technical uh, colorist to be the best stylist. Like people who think that are kind of missing the point of what a good stylist is all about. Um, so by me showing them away, and with a few I had to force it, and I actually lost a couple of staff over this that couldn't cope with it. And I was, I knew that was going to happen, and I was okay with it. I had to kind of take a step back in terms of losing a few out of the team to build it back up again because I needed the right people there to drive the core of this company forward. Um, once I got them onto it and they started doing it and we start doing exercises every Wednesday morning for half an hour, people started to feel this kind of urge to do something bigger than themselves. And because of the company, what we've got, where we are very, we know how to do all types of hair types. Now I know in probably America and the UK, everyone knows how to do Afro hair. 
right? In Australia, that's not a thing, which still blows me bloody mind. But there is very, very white areas of, of, of Melbourne and same as Sydney, Brisbane. They're very, very white areas. And there's, there's now more colour coming in and around the area. It's becoming more diverse. And there's a lot more different types of people in and around areas, different religions, different races, different hair types. We know how to do all hair types. And that came from us talking about intrinsic motivators and making sure that we love on everyone. And one of the big motivators behind the culture was we want to make everyone feel welcome. To make everyone feel welcome, you have to be able to do everyone's hair. You can't turn someone away because their hair is too curly for you. Like, that's nuts. So that was another thing. So the culture was driven through them finding out what they actually want to do. And then me linking it to something in their life and then linking it back to the salon. So they might say, I want to buy a house, for example. Cool. Well, you're going to need X amount of money. So you need to earn 110K a year. This is what you need to bring in for the salon to earn 110K a year. This is how your buying structure works. You get to here, I'll give you 110k a year. It's, it's black and white. Mm. Okay, so how much of the, the training that you give your team mm -hmm. is technical and creative sort of training as opposed to how much time do you spend on personal development, on mindset stuff? Because I'm all, all over that. I 100% agree with you that there's no point in trying to teach someone to you know, set goals, sell shampoo, you know, yeah. achieve certain figures if their beliefs and you know etc are not in line with that you need to work yep. on their mindset before you work on those you know the, those communication Absolutely. skills of how to yep. do certain things so so talk yep. to us about about what what that looks like in the salon so we, we could it's I, i'd say this this year coming so what i've got projected for this year it's pretty much a 50 50 split I'd say we, we've got 23 days of internal education booked for this year. And I run mm. them all the way through to September and then October, November, December, I give them a break because they're usually mm. over me by then and they don't want to hear any more education by then. Um, yeah, we've got 23 days and I reckon they're split 50-50. But uh, for example, so we're doing your super stylist course, right? Mm. We're about to start that. Um, so that's in there with the mindset because I know you touch on some of that as well. Which, mm. And it, hearing it from a different voice can drill home certain aspects that I'm not able to drill home. Um, totally. yeah. So that, yeah. that we're really looking forward to that. The technical side, I'm big on. And I think the difference between a craft hairdresser and a good hairdresser is their bad day. And the way you make your bad day a good day is by making sure your technique is perfect or as close to mm -hmm. perfect as it can get. And the only way mm -hmm. your technique gets better is by practice, 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 repetition, 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 discipline, discipline, discipline. Um, so that is part of the culture where we go over haircuts five or six times sometimes in mm. our training until it's imprinted in their brain so hard that even if they try to forget it, they can't, they just can't mm. forget it. So that way, if they have broken up with their boyfriend, they've had a shitty morning, um, mm. the, the mom doesn't like them or they fell out with their dad or whatever it is, right? I know that their technical side of their ability is so tight that mm. their one o'clock on a Friday isn't going to have a different haircut to six mm. eight weeks ago when they were jubilant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I believe right. that is how you, I think that's the cornerstone of a company in terms of creating money. Yeah. Um, we, we don't have long left. We've got about 10 minutes left, but yeah. I wanted to, there's two things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so we're going to do them quickly. I want to talk about money. Yep. And and num and numbers because I know yep. that's a, a something you've become very passionate about. But before Huge, we yeah. do that, I just want to I just want to ask you about Gen Z. So mm -hmm. you know those people in your workforce that are under the age of twenty five. So yep. you know they're, they're the Gen Zers. Yeah. Um, and they get a fair bit of stick. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. often un often unwarranted in my agreed. opinion. Yeah, um, uh, but what I want to ask you about, I know you said you've got a lot of people on your team that are in their in their thirties, etc. It's, 50, uh, it's a 50-50 split. It's, it's a 50-50 right, okay. split. Yeah, I've got a 50-50 so, split. So, so what did the, the new gen, the Gen Z employees, what differences do you see in them compared to when you were their age? Like, what, what are they bringing to the table that is, that is good for, for you and your business? Oh, they give a shit about the world a lot more than I ever used to. Bloody mm. hell, they give a shit about the world a lot more. Like, I... When I was 19, I did, couldn't tell you what a plastic bag did. 
I didn't know that it. I didn't even know that it didn't decompose. I reckon, like because it wasn't a story. It wasn't a. It wasn't yeah. a discussion point. It was just yeah. a plastic bag that you got from Tesco's, and then it just went in the bin. That was it. Mm. So mm. I've learned. I reckon I've learned probably more off um, my crew than I reckon they've learned off me collectively. Genuinely, um, certain things like the way we approach. Um, the safe space for transgender and uh, non-binary. I knew enough because I've done my research, but I've actually got people from those communities who work for me. So I was able to get first-hand information. How would you like this approached? How mm. would you or your friends who is transgender, how would they like this to work? How would they look at that and go, I feel really safe. I feel good mm. about that. So uh, they've got a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. And I, they do get a lot of unwarranted stick, but I do also think, and this is this is kind of where I sit, and it's not offence sitting. I do think the younger generations have to respect what's come and gone, definitely. Mm. Um, but I also think that the, the the generations of yesteryear also need to understand that back when they were the equivalent age, they mm. were trying to train change everything as well. <laughs> mm, yeah, of course. All it is, yeah. it's you've they've yeah. just transferred the shoe from you to them, and you don't like it, and that's it. Right. Yeah. Everyone's tried, every generation has tried to screw things up one way or another. And every mm. generation passes like, oh, they don't make them like they used to. Um, I've had this off. I've had this off my parents before. Oh, do you mm. know, they don't work like, oh, yeah, cool. We'll bring the good old days back where slavery had just been abolished. Gay people couldn't get married. Oh, they sound like great days. Like racism yeah. was r rife everywhere. Great days yeah. of bringing those back. It was shit. It, the best mm. day to live in is right now. And the generation that are coming through, I believe, will be better than the generation that's just gone. Mm. And it will be the same in 25, 30 years. They'll be doing the yeah. same thing. They'll be looking at that generation yeah, going, yeah. oh, God, look at these. Like, they will be the best generation <laughs> coming through. Because yeah. the world evolves. People evolve. Yeah. The way they get taught coding and social media. I don't shit all about that. I've learned mm. so much off the younger generation just from that. So I love, okay. I love Gen Zs. I love them. They're brilliant. Good. Good. Yeah, me too. Okay, so let's talk about money uh, before mm -hmm. we wrap up. Um, I want to just ask you, you know, now you've got a different awareness of business of, yeah. you know, because you don't have the accountant looking after stuff, you're, you're yeah. in there and you're all over these numbers. And you've found it to be a real passion. Uh, yeah. I, I often ask this question of different salon owners, just to sort of get a reference to how they how they think. Yeah. What do you think a salon should be achieving realistically as a profit margin. And when I say a profit margin, I mean, after everything's, everything's been, been paid, paid. Yeah. including you as the owner, because a yeah. lot of people <laughs> think that, that yeah. the owner's <laughs> wage is the profit and that's the owner's yeah. wage. It's not the profit. So, so yeah. do you have any sort of percentage that you'd like to sort yeah. of hang on that? Uh, I think anything less than 10%, you're just buying yourself a job. There's no point. You might as well work for someone. Genuinely, mm -hmm. like if you're not if you're not profiting at least ten percent, that I believe there's no point. You might as well stop. And I, I really believe that in in Australia we don't have a staff shortage. We have too many salons, way mm. too many salons. There's so Definitely. many staff. There's just mm. salons everywhere that have got two, three staff in them. How they're not making ten percent? I know the average. The average. I think the average turn or the average percentage over here is between two and three percent for a salon. What's the point? You're making five, ten grand max on top of whatever you've earned as a wage. It's pointless. Yeah. So what did you say? The average salon over there has got two or three people. But believe it or not, it's not that different elsewhere. I yeah, think right. there's a I think there's a perception that people go, oh, all the salons in America are big. Well, no, they're not. Mm. They, the average salon in America yeah. has probably got about five people in it, and it's probably yeah. the same in the UK. Yeah. But right. You also have salons in America with a hundred odd people working yeah. in them, but that's not the yeah. norm. They are the yeah. unicorns. Yeah. So I, I it's mean, crazy. My, my observation, the average salon all over the world has got less than five people in it. Yeah. Right. And most of them are lifestyle businesses, meaning that the owner yeah. drives a nice car and it's their own boss and they have a holiday once a year. Yeah. But in terms of profit, they're not making anything like 10%. No, nah, my, my aim is 20%. I want 20%, yeah. but then I also want every senior staff member to be earning six figures before I take 20%. Okay. If I'm taking 20% and everyone's earning six figures, I've done my job properly. So yeah. last last year we did a we did a price freeze when everyone else put their prices up. And that was mm -hmm. to draw more new clients into the salon because we became the bottom side of top end price-wise, but we deliver a top end 
um, yeah. hairstyle and experience. Mm. Uh, it worked really well. We did drive a lot of new people into the salon. Um, we're now putting the prices up, but the, the idea is 10% minimum, 20% is the aim, and I want that by the end of 2024. Um, right. 20% okay. profit, I think with that, I can, I, I, and I, I say this to everyone, I want to earn $350,000, $400,000 a year. And I'm not ashamed to say that. People mm. make money the enemy all the time, and I don't know why. Like, there's good people. Right, I know arseholes who are broke, I know arseholes who are rich. That's simple, mm. right? Just because you've got money doesn't make you an asshole, right? Make mm. it, you can do good things with money. You can give people pay rises. You can take people away. You can give them education opportunities. You so much if you have the money to do it. Um, mm. And people have vindicated money for a while. I'm sick of it. Um, but yeah, 20%, I think, is really what I'm aiming for. Any more than that, genuinely, in today's market, I think would be a real stretch to do. I really do mm. with the way yeah. it is. Well, let me ask you about retail then. Um, what yep. what what sort of percentage of your total sales and your business model at the moment? What percentage of that is coming from retail? Uh, and for the annual year last year, it was fifteen point three percent. Right. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, a little bit lower than what I like. A little bit lower okay. than what I like, but but, but, it's, but, but again, right. well above uh, above what the average is. Uh, let yeah. me ask you: is that is that percentage growing? Or is it shrinking? Because a lot of people will talk about the impact that um, online sales is having. So I'm curious as to yeah, how you I, see that. I see. I, I have a different opinion. I don't. People have bought online for decades. I don't really understand. <laughs> I don't think it's changed really. I really don't. I think as always goes up. As always goes up. But then hmm. the the way the way that we the way we recommend retail might be slightly different in our consultation to what other people do. Um, we don't do, we don't necessarily do the, the whole old school thing and make sure there's three products in front of everyone. They're touching and feeling it. We don't do that. We get them to actually tell us exactly what's wrong with their hair. And then we just give them the bloody solution. So in our consultation, we have a consultation form. We don't give it to everyone because some people you don't, there's some clients you're like, mm, I'm not a massive fan of consultation forms, but they definitely work for the newer stylists to get them into the routine of asking the right question. It's the only reason why we use them. Um, once people are in the routine of asking the right question, uh, you pretty much all you have to do is get the client to tell you exactly what's wrong with their hair. And you go, cool. Well, without going into the whole jargon of it, some people like it, most don't. Without going into mm. all the, the the fact that it doesn't have so many rest sulfate in it and it does this with poppy seeds. Most people couldn't give a shit about that. They just want to know it fixes the hair. So it's really yeah. dry. That'll fix a dry. It's brittle. That'll fix brittle. You say it gets freezing humidity. Put this on. After you blow dry it, it'll stop the humidity. If they don't want to take it, they look a bit dumb because they've gone, this is my problem. You've given me a solution. I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to do it. Cool. All mm -hmm. right. Well, it's your own thing then, isn't it? Don't come back to me next time and say your hair's still frizzy because it will yeah, be because yeah. I've given you yeah, a solution. Okay. You're not going to take it. Um, and right. so, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think online sales have taken it. But I think people just use it as an excuse because the consultations have got crap. If mm -hmm. I'm honest, mm -hmm. I, I don't yeah. know many, we, we do consultations with every client every time, even if we've been seeing them for six, seven years. Because you have to do it because people, mm. you don't know what people are going through. They might want to change and you haven't asked them. You're going to lose clients that way. Um, mm. So, yeah, we're, we're very big on consultation. I think that's why our retail is always growing and always high. Okay. All right. Last thing that we've got time to talk about is how you pay people. Mm -hmm. So can, can you share with us what sort of system that you have for paying your, your stylists, your money makers? So we have uh, a few different levels. So we've got master stylist, principal stylist, advanced stylist, senior stylist. We have emerging, which is the third year apprentice that's starting to, well, that's on the floor pretty much full time. Um, and they obviously a tiered system. So from top to bottom goes up and down in price. Each level has a set per hour rate. So there isn't a two people on the same level that have two different wages. So in Australia here, you cannot hide what you're paying someone. So before there used to be a rule where it was law where you could put strictly confidential on the top of a contract, and that means that person couldn't tell the, the person in the same position what they're being paid. So no one okay. could compete. In mm -hmm. Australia, that's been taken away, which I'm bloody for as well. I don't mm -hmm. think you should, it's money. You should talk about money. Um, so everyone gets paid a rate for the position they're in. When you go into a team leader or a leadership role within our leadership team, you get paid more. But that's separate and everyone knows that's separate. 
So hang on. So each level there is yep. an hourly rate, and it's yes. a different hourly rate as you move up a level. Yeah. Right. So every time you get okay. promoted, you get a. Yeah. a it's, I think the smallest increase is three and a half dollars. The biggest increase is six dollars. Yeah. Okay. So okay. it goes up and up and up. And um, there is no once you get to that top level, there's no limit to what you can earn though in terms of hourly mm -hmm. rate. Um, you could quite as e easily earn fifty dollars an hour plus commission if you're bringing in the cash. Not a problem. Mm. So, 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 where does the hourly rate start at? What, what's the dollar value for the first level? Uh, so, the se seniors twenty five dollars an hour, mm -hmm. um, which is only just above award. So, they're for people that have just qualified. Usually, people mm. sit on senior no longer than a year, or they're mm. new stylists that have hired that need retraining. Um, okay. So that's and the kind highest of the entry level. Uh, right. highest, highest at the minute is 35, 35, thirty five. Thirty five at the minute. Yeah, thirty five right. an hour. And then we have a commission structure. So that's broken down. So for example, we'll work on master stylist because that's the highest level, right? So master stylist has to bring in $5,250 minus GST. So if, once you've removed your VAT, that's what they need to bring in. Mm. Once they hit that, they get 5% of the total they've bought in, right? So it's what, $287 as just a clean boat, just for hitting the minimum point. Then they every five hundred dollars they go above which our average ticket is 264 so every five hundred dollars they go above they get seven percent and then if they go a thousand dollars above they get ten percent of the whole thing so if you're putting in six two fifty a, a week you're getting six hundred and twenty five dollars in your bank account as a bonus right they okay. then have a separate bonus scheme the one thing when i first took over my I believe there's two, there's about five or six numbers really as a business you should have your eyes over all the time. Mm -hmm. Mine personally, my one is, my biggest one is new clients to making sure they're coming in. But then my staff's is retention rate and rebooking. So we've got, they're, they're, they're the same, one and the same thing, but we have two different ways of going about it. I'm the one that has to bring them in with my marketing, with the videos on Instagram, making sure that the posts are right and that the haircuts are done, the colors are looking good and we're funny and interactive and we do polls and all that kind of stuff that you have to do as a modern day salon. My staff's job is to make sure they don't go. We spend so much money on trying to bring in new clients and forget that, and I think I've definitely heard this on one of your podcasts before, that the number of people that are retained after one isn't the number you need to look at. It's whether mm. they've come back after a year, six visits or five or six yeah. visits. If they're still there after five or six visits, you've really got them. They, they're yours. You're going to have to do a complete mess up to get rid of them, I believe. So we, they focus on that number. I focus on bringing them in. We're doing that with the way our, with the way our structure works is with the second part of the commission structure is the rebooking, I wanted to put a, a dollar value on the rebooking to make it so incentivized, but also link it with something else. If you didn't hit your rebooking, you wouldn't get some, you wouldn't get a certain part of your cash. I wanted all the focus to be on rebooking. So I linked treatments and rebooking. We're a very high treatment salon. So our average stylist is about 12 treatments uh, a week and they're usually seeing 18 people. So we've got around about 60, 65% of clients having treatments all the time. We've got one that does about 25 a week. She's an absolute legend at it, but that's different. Um, so what they do is with the treatments, they get a 20% of the total money they bought in with treatments, providing their rebooking's been hit. So they can have an average week on takings, have a day off, say as a public holiday and only work three days, miss their target by $100, but still take $200 home in, in their bonus just by making sure they're doing their job and mm. recommending uh, treatments. I don't target on retail because our retailing is always pretty good. And they know it's been built into the culture that if you don't recommend retail, you've not done your job. You're supposed to look after their hair. And yeah, okay. so we, we don't target on retail because we don't want, uh, sorry, it, it's that built into the culture where it's part of your job. Um, mm. It's just all put into a combined total. And um, most, most of the people in the salon will do a minimum of 450, 500 retail a week anyway. So we're there or thereabouts where your target would be. So, um, mm. but I, I do find that, especially coming into Christmas, when you've had your Christmas packs come out in November, everyone does $1,100, $1,200 a week in, in retail. 
And then you get to Christmas and everyone's bought everything. And you've got some of these people are chucking in six and a half, seven thousand dollars a week into my till. And they were missing their retail by $80 and not getting a bonus. I thought that was shit. I was like, that's not fair. You've worked so hard and you don't get a bonus just because you sold $1,100 six weeks ago. So I changed it mm. and it's, it's worked well. It's worked really well. Good. But yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Well, listen, Tom, it's been fascinating talking to you. There's some, some great um, insights you've got there as to, you know, how you're running your business. Um, we need to wrap up, unfortunately. So uh, if you're listening to this podcast with Tom White and you've enjoyed it, then do me a favor, take a screenshot on your phone and share it to Instagram stories. And don't forget to subscribe to the Grow My Salon Business podcast and leave us a rating and review if you want on the Apple podcast app. So, um, Tom, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today it's, Pleasure, um, it's been, me. been great I've, I've wanted to talk to you for a while and uh, you've definitely got a you know a great take on the industry and uh, it's been really good to to have you here uh, whereabouts can people connect with you on instagram or any other social media channels yeah so instagram is probably the best way of getting me at the minute i'm i, I think i'm too old for tiktok i've been told but i'm trying so on instagram it's at uh tom white underscore same same but different um, you can also look at the salon Instagram as well, where we, we talk a lot about our, our values and our brand pillars and stuff, which is at same, same, but different dot salon. They're the best two ways to get me. Um, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Well, look, I will put those links on our website, growmysalonbusiness.com and in the show notes for today's podcast. So Tom White, thank you so much for being a guest on this week's Grow My Salon Business podcast. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you'd like to connect with us, you'll find us at growmysalonbusiness.com or on Facebook and Instagram at growmysalonbusiness. And if you enjoyed tuning into our podcast, make sure that you subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Until next time, this is Anthony Whitaker wishing you continued success.